uh, good afternoon. I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, Kai Alman. Uh, Kai is a big supporter of Six Sigma process, and he was implementing Six Sigma in uh, General Electric for many years. Uh, and uh, he decided to use his experience uh, in wine business, and uh, in 1999, he purchased a piece of land and started growing wine and making perfect wine using Six Sigma principles, uh, which uh, always was a mystery for me. So uh, Kai is here to talk to us about uh, how he does it and uh, any interesting details about that. Uh, please uh, welcome Kai Alman. Thank you very much, Dennis, and thank you very much for those of you who came here. Uh, there will be two sections. We will talk a little bit about Six Sigma and how we use it in the wine business. Uh, and then we will taste the product so you can see that it actually works. But first, a question. How many of you know anything about Six Sigma? Any black belts? Any green belts? Any master black belts? I just want to know where, how much you know about it and uh, get a feel for the audience. The next important... Okay, great. Uh, the next important question is, how many of you know how to make wine? Oh, that's, that's more serious, huh? Really? Something about it? Wow, that's a real practitioner. Well, let's get on with you. It, and what I plan to do is to talk a little bit about how we created the company, then talk a little bit about the product we have, then gradually take you through the process of, of making wine, and then finally show you a little bit about we, uh, how we put the Six Sigma processes around it. Uh, the company was created in 99. We bought 4,300 acres in the northern part of California, up north of Napa Valley. It was an old cattle ranch, and we decided to start to develop some vineyards, not all of it, because we were shooting for uh, high-class wine so, uh, and not mass production. And by now, we have received a lot of good press. We have received some good ratings. Uh, there's a professional magazine for Six Sigma folks called I Six Sigma. It goes to all what they call belts in corporate America, and we've been featured there a couple of times. Last month, there was a, a big article about how we use some of the principles, and they come out and, and, uh, and visit us and, and use us as a test case. We, we have a pretty interesting test case for Six Sigma. Not that we are perfect Six Sigma at this stage, but we have structured the company as a Six Sigma company. Most other companies are companies that have been around for a number of years. And when they get into Six Sigma, they have to start to break things up in the old tradition of the company. They can't build it from scratch. So we've been lucky that way. It's, it has been a little easier for us. I'll talk a little more about that when we get uh, to that. But our vision for the company is to create exceptional wine. Uh, but we don't see it just as wine. We see wine as an experience. It's not just about having a glass of wine. It's maybe coming to the ranch sitting in a nice spot and uh, having a nice meal or whatever it is, whatever your experience is. But we are selling an, ex uh, of course we have to make good wine, but we think we are selling an experience, not just another bottle of wine. We offer educations. We are, uh, have put a conservation easement on the ranch. We protect the land so it will stay as, as a natural, uh, national park, basically. And we also spend a lot of time on improving the land and offering education, environmental education to kids in the area because it, we think it's very important that kids grow up as uh, good stewards of the land going forward. There's so much going on in the world today, so if you can uh, chip in and, and do a little education for children, that would work really well. The strategy is to consistently uh, produce high quality wine and that is at, right at the core of Six Sigma because you all know the lock, uh, normal curve and the standard deviation. And the last thing you want when you produce something of quality is to have too much standard deviation in there. And uh, when you're at the sixth level uh, with a standard deviation, uh, you have very little deviation from where you want to be. So that is uh, one of the core things that we look at. 
But let me talk a little bit about what I find is very important uh, in the Six Sigma world. Uh, there are two key words up there. The first one is focus on your customer, and the other one is to sync process. If you think about most traditional uh, corporations in the world or in North America, they are structured the old-fashioned way with departments or silos, and they have a hierarchy, uh, and they produce something, and then they spend millions of dollars in promoting that to the marketplace. When you are in the Six Sigma world, you try to understand what your customer wants, and then you design your company internally with processes that are geared to meet what is critical for that customer. We felt it big time, and let me just skip forward to the next slide. Uh, when we moved from the manufacturing side at General Electric to financial services, half of General Electric is financial services, and while it's easy to measure a defect or something that's not right in manufacturing, I mean, we, here we took a company that are making sticks, and the sticks have to be two feet long, and if they're not two feet long, long but deviate from that, you have a defect. Everybody can understand that. But what is a defect in a financial service company? A bank, an insurance company? And we went out and we started to focus on the customer. We interviewed the customer. It doesn't sound like a novel idea, but trust me, for many financial institutions it is. They produce something and then they try to force people to buy it. So we talk, for example, to automobile customers. And automobile customers will tell you Listen, guys, basically we don't want to talk to you guys because we don't like insurance, we don't like insurance companies. But there's one moment of tension where we have to talk to insurance companies, and that's when we have a claim. And what is critical for us when we have a claim? Two very basic things, and I'll exaggerate a little bit, but the first one is that when we call you with this claim to report it, you pick up the phone because we are frustrated. We want to talk to somebody who knows how to handle a claim. The second thing that is critical to quality for the customer in that process is that we pay them pretty fast. If you have a claim of $3,000, you don't want to negotiate with a legal department for six months about whether it's $2,800 or $3,200. You just want to check within 48 hours and get it over and done with, get on with your life and forget that you even have an insurance company. So those are, that's the voice of the customer in this process here. When it comes to the great business uh, we uh, will get back to the sorting of grapes and a number of other things. But we started to introduce that in the business, and I'll talk to you about the voice of the customer, because it's a lot more difficult. I could go around here and ask each and every one of you what is important for you as a wine customer, and I'll probably get uh, 14 different answers, I guess, uh, because you have different views on, on what's important. Let me just skip back, because I skipped one little step here. Uh, the method at the bottom here, to make, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. That's another cornerstone of the Six Sigma process. Uh, whenever you do something, you go back, and then you try to analyze what you really did, and then you improve it again until you get to the right level. It's, it's common sense, but uh, what really makes Six Sigma work is that you get data around the different steps in the process so you can measure whether you made the improvements you were talking about. Let's talk a little bit about the product and let's talk about what I mentioned to you, the voice of the customer. There are a lot of different criteria. Some people will tell you it's price. I have a, an, an old friend, uh, he's retired now, he loves wine, he drinks wine every day, and I said to him, Mike, what's important for you when you buy a bottle of wine? He says, well, if it's just me and my wife, I will not pay more than $15 for a bottle of wine. So that's my quality criteria for wine. If we have visitors over for dinner, uh, I will go up to $25 and I buy a recognized brand. And I said, why do you do that? Well, I don't want to be criticized. I want to feel safe. And that's an interesting thing about the wine because some people are uncomfortable with the wine. They don't feel that they know enough, unless you make it yourself, of course, uh, to brands out and try something so they will play safe. And that's a very good criteria. I would say, however, that I would drink the $25 bottle with my wife and give the $15 bottle to my friends, but that would be my criteria. There are other criteria here. People say wine is an experience. Uh, sit with a good bottle of Cabernet in front of the fireplace on a cold evening or sit under a tree somewhere. The wine tastes a lot better if you're with good friends. 
uh, so there are a lot of different things. We've talked about the price. We've talked about the, uh, uh, the taste is, is a tough one because uh, that's up to you. The only thing we can try to do is to make wine without any flaws in it from a technical point of view. And then we can try to cover a wide spectrum so we have something for different segments of, of wine drinkers. Then we also use a lot of research. The Wine Market Council does research in restaurants with sommeliers, with consumers, use all the uh, normal interview uh, companies like Nielsen Studies and stuff like that. Uh, we use taste evaluation programs and we do a lot of reviews for our wine clubs because they are close to us and they are normally willing to, to talk about the wines. Today we have seven different wines uh, on the market and uh, we can do elaborate tasting notes, but what we've done here is basically to start with a, a couple of the whites, then over the light rosé to a Pinot Noir, down to a Bordeaux style, we call it Cuvée Picnic, and a Cabernet, and then the heavier guys at the bottom, the Cabernet Sauvignon and the Tempranillo. And the releases, we had uh, three wines in 06, 07 we had five, and in 08 we had them all seven on the marketplace. But you can see, there are different flavors, different styles. Uh, these two guys here spent two years in oak, French oak barrels. This one has literally no oak because there are people who prefer it without that. The two whites as one with oak, one without. Um, and we have people coming in stating their criteria for what they want uh, to try and taste. So that's our way of getting closer to the voice of the customer. I'll openly admit that it's the toughest thing. We work on it every day and we get more and more analysis uh, from customers. Let's talk a little bit about the marketplace of wine and where our focus is in, in that before we get into the actual wine, uh, wine making process. And today Italy is still the biggest wine consumer in the world with 16% of all wine consumed. United States is catching up fast. Uh, last year was for reasons that we all know a little downturn, uh, but uh, strangely enough, uh, the forecast was an increase every year over the next couple of years of 8%. Uh, so far, we are up 47 this year despite the downturn. So it's still moving. And what is happening in the U.S. Uh, is that consumers are getting a more normal attitude to wine like they have in the Mediterranean part of the world where you have a glass of wine with your dinner. It's not some, some, wine is not something you drink on special occasions. Then you drink maybe a lot of it and then you don't drink it for a long period of time. It becomes more part of the day-to-day -day culture uh, for a lot of people. We are very focused on our segmentation. Uh, because of our name Six Sigma, uh, we really focus on corporate America. Uh, and get it into companies where uh, they use Six Sigma. The Six Sigma Academy, which is the biggest training institution in the world for Six Sigma people, uh, is working with us. I'm on their advisory board uh, and, and I, I help them uh, in various uh, segments of the business. So that's a strong niche for us and it's a little different from what other uh, wineries uh, do. Some people sometimes say that by using Six Sigma, are we trying to take the romance out of the business? Um, actually, I think that making wine lends itself to Six Sigma because there are a lot of things that you can measure in the process. The other area is uh, uh, direct to consumers, where we focus on people who, of course, enjoy wine, who are willing to pay a reasonable price for a good bottle of wine, and who likes the lifestyle that comes with, with drinking good wine, and who love to come and spend time with us on the ranch. About the market, you have two lines here, and this is, I think, a very interesting chart. The pink line shows the production, or if you like, the capacity of the vineyards planted in California. And the blue line shows uh, the consumption. And what you see here is that when there has been an overproduction and the pink line crosses the blue line, all the growers of grapes get scared, so they pull back and stop planting vineyard and then there will be a deficit of wine a couple of years later. It's normally about a three year cycle uh, because when you plant a vineyard, it takes three years before you get any fruit off it. And during the first year, you only get one third of the fruit, give and take, next year, two thirds of the fruit, and the 
in the six, seven years you, you have full production. But you can see how, how it moves up and down, and it takes three years for the uh, vineyards to uh, catch up. Right now, the vineyards are behind, uh, backed by the last peak that you see there in 2006. Uh, growers became very careful with planting, and uh, some wineries are not producing this year because of the crisis. Um, so the production or the, the inventory of wine uh, will be behind in the, in the next two to three years. There will be quite a bit of scarcity. And I'm not saying that trying to sell wine because I'm so small that I can't, I can't fill the gap anyway. The process of making wine. Let's do a pictorial first. The best soil for red grapes are red volcanic soils, as you find them up in Northern California, where you have at least three volcanoes. You have Mount Santa Helena, you have Mount Canocti, and you have Cup Mountain in our area. The problem with the red soils is that they have a lot of rocks, so sometimes it's not enough to just rip the, uh, the soils. We rip the soils with big caterpillar dosers five feet down so we can stake it and put in our irrigation, but sometimes we have to bring in the big hammer to, to get the rocks out. We pull out rocks the size of a car sometimes. Uh, but that, that is soil that really drains well. The fertility is not too high, and it works really well for the red grapes. Then you stake your vineyard, you plant it, and then you take good care of it for three years. It starts to look like that. And then finally you get to your first harvest, and you're very happy because maybe one day you'll get some return for all your hard work. But that was the first truck of uh, Champonillo grape that we took off that uh, vineyard in 2005. And then you get to the winery, and one of the things we get back to when we talk about the production of wine is the consistency. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we have very consistent fruit. If you go out into the vineyard, you will see all kinds of clusters hanging there, maybe some sunburn, maybe some bird damage, maybe some over-ripening, maybe some under-ripening. But once your grapes are getting off the final sorting table here and hits the crusher that breaks the skin open before fermentation, you want to make sure that you have complete consistency in what you uh, use as a base. Then after you crush the grapes, you pump them over into these tanks here, the fermentation tanks. They're stainless steel so you can keep it absolutely clean. And uh, they also have what you call a jacket. You can s barely see these little boxes here, but we can go in and punch in the temperature, make sure that it's constant during fermentation. And we can also uh, control that uh, remotely now. So anywhere in the world, you can go in on a, a laptop and check and adjust and do whatever you have to do to the wine. With the red wines, uh, we, uh, the, the high-end wines, we store them in French oak barrels, and we do that for two years. We have a little cave uh, uh, on the ranch where we do that. Uh, we, of course, take care of it during that process, taste it, analyze it, make sure that everything is going right, and then finally, we bottle it. So now you can make wine, at least at the high level. Let's try to put a few Six Sigma processes around this. Because what it, we, the main processes, and as I said to you, we have organized the company uh, along Six Sigma processes. And they're basically three processes. The grape growing, the farming, or whatever you want to call it, the first section of it. The second one is the actual wine making after you get the food to the winery. And the last process is uh, the, the wine selling, the marketing, the public relationships, and whatever goes with that. And we have three process owners uh, at the winery, uh, one for each of these uh, major steps here. So let's try to break it down even further. If we look at uh, the first step, the farming side, the first thing you do is to do your uh, research. You go out and you monitor the climate for at least a year. Uh, you do all the soil reports. Um, and uh, you dig, dig down and check uh, both the chemical and the, and the physical aspects of it. Uh, you check the elevation. You look at uh, the aspect, which way it's uh, faced. Is it facing northeast or southwest? 
and you also start to talk about how you want to direct your rows. We use some NASA computer models for that because we want the same sun exposure on both sides. Again, back to consistency of the food. So once you do all that, you, you check for water and temperature and stuff like that. One, one important thing about temperature is uh, the months of April because that's the months when you get the butt break. And if you get butt, uh, frost uh, in, uh, during butt break, you can lose most of your crop. There were a couple of big vineyards in Napa Valley lost 80% of all their crops last year, which of course is a disaster. Uh, then you go in and you start to prepare your vineyard. You select the kind of clones you want. And given the soil composition, you can adjust the growth by selecting different rootstocks. Every vine is grafted on a rootstock. Uh, and that happened originally because uh, there were some serious attacks on, on vineyards with uh, various diseases like phylloxera. Uh, so uh, people started to find rootstocks that were resistant to that. But with that also came different types of rootstocks that had different capabilities when it came to uh, taking out of the soil what they had to take out. So we use that a lot. And let me drill down even further and give you a couple of examples. Here's a, a more detailed uh, breakdown of the process of the site research where we do the temperature of the soil and all that good stuff and that goes into uh, a SIPOC process in the Six Sigma language supplier input process output customer and back to the process thinking every process has a supplier and you have some output that goes to the next uh, customer in the chain which is the next process step until it finally reaches uh, the ultimate customer. And that's why it's so important to think process when you think Six Sigma, because you have to have all your process steps aligned uh, so one feeds into the next one and you measure that you're offering the right level all the way through. A lot of big companies stepping away from the wine business, for example, have discovered that once they start to do that, they have a lot of processes that they don't need. They just used to do them. Some big banks did analysis of their processes, and it came out that they, 40% of what they did was basically redundant. But they had, it has just evolved over time, and it was not really used. So by cleaning it up and streamlining the process, they saved an awful lot of money. So one of the steps is the soil analysis, and we try to dig down and get a physical profile of the dirt and we map it out in different kinds of, of dirt here uh, at different layers. Uh, we stop here at this case at uh, 40 uh, inches and, and we stop there because it was base rock. We couldn't get down any further. Uh, we also stop if we know that uh, two feet further down it's going to be exactly the same. And then we do a chemical uh, test and then we decide how we can mediate uh, if, for example, the pH is too high or it needs magnesium or whatever the, the thing is, we will adjust for that. Uh, or we will decide that this is not a site that can be used at all. There's just too much to do. It's too far away from where we, we normally would be. One chemical that is critical is boron. And uh, we have sites on the ranch where we just have too much boron to even think about mediating. But in every step, we get the data around the process and then we decide whether we can get to the consistency that we want in our production or whether we want to do something else. And then we have the usual uh, dashboards where we, that's a Six Sigma thing, you have dashboards for everything so you can visually see whether you're right on or whether you are out on the sides. Um, and of course we have numbers around this as well. When it comes to the winemaking, I talked a little bit about uh, the sorting of the grapes, which is very important. And the way we do it is to send our workers into the vineyard uh, several times per year. Uh, June, July, we cut off the fruit where we can see at that point in time that it's not going to make it. The first harvest will normally be at the end of August, uh, but it can stretch into late fall. Uh, the night before harvest, when we feel that the fruit is ready and we've done all the chemical analysis, we've done the tastings in the vineyard, uh, we will go in and cut off fruit that doesn't look good. And then we'll bring it into the winery in small bins. These are 40-pound bins to protect the fruit so it doesn't get squeezed. 
and we will put the clusters on a sorting table, pull out leaves and stuff that doesn't look nice. The next sorting table is more of a, uh, after the destemming, is a shaking table. So if there are small unripe berries still around, they will shake out through a grid that fits that particular grape type. And then they'll go to a long sorting table, which hopefully I have a picture of here. And that's the one you've seen before, where we have 10 people just picking out the fruit uh, before it hits the crusher at the end. And, uh, gets into the fermentation. So we have very consistent fruit when we get to that level. We train the sorters at the sorting tables uh, so we make sure that they have the same standards uh, because one sorter might think that that's good enough but we actually compare them, put them up in parallel and make sure that we have the reliability in the sorting of the food. When it gets into the chemical part of the winemaking, that's sort of for Six Sigma the easy part because you have all the things that, that you can measure in the lab, the acidity, the sugar, the alcohol, and we use these run charts that I used a lot in Six Sigma, and you have your levels for being within Six Sigma, which is basically a standard deviation on, on both sides. Um, so we use these run charts for controlling all of that. Um, so far, I I hope I've convinced you that we're pretty careful with what we do and that we produce good wine, but we've had our issues. So this is an example of where you don't want to be. And we have corrected it, it's a couple of years old. Uh, but after the alcoholic fermentation, you get the malolactic fermentation. And uh, the malolactic fermentation transforms malic acids into lactic acids. Um, and that's a more mellow acid, so if it does it go that way, you get a smoother wine, a nicer wine from a, from a taste point of view. So, so it's an attractive thing. The wine starts that process itself. Uh, the issue with it is that it can be very slow and it can attract a lot of bacteria in the process. And if you do that, uh, you can get an infection in the wine and you get a high VA. You can't control the volatile acidity. So you get all over the chart, as you can see, with the black curve here. We want to be within the red, but we were basically outside. And if you don't stop that, you can stop it, but uh, the wine tur turns into vinaigre, and you certainly don't want that to happen, because that was not the business we were set out to do. Uh, the last process is the sale of the wine, and in the the alcohol business in the U.S. is heavily regulated. Uh, it goes back to prohibition uh, where the government said that you had to go to wholesalers in different areas. You could not go directly to customers and you need a license per state and you need a wholesaler per state or you need it. A couple of years ago the Supreme Court said that that was unconstitutional so now some of the states are opening up. And today we can use brokers, we can use wholesalers, we can sell directly to corporations, we can sell directly to consumers, and we do that through the tasting room and to our wine club and to our website, of course. Uh, and we try to monitor all that. The most interesting thing for us uh, is the website, uh, because on the website we can track the data. We, uh, these, these are old data, so it, it, it does, it's more for uh, illustrative purposes, but you can really track consumers' behavior. And we use uh, one of your tools to, to analyze the data here, uh, and it's extremely helpful. So you can see on the website where they go, how they behave, and what to adjust. And we are in the process now of uh, updating our website according to the data we get out of that. Right now, we get a lot of traffic because of the Six Sigma name. We have traffic from 79 countries around the world, and that's okay, uh, but of course, we don't expect Six Sigma users of the process Six Sigma users uh, uh, in India to buy wine online and have it shipped to India for five times the price of the wine. So it's okay they get on, but that's not whom we want to cater to. We really need to drill down and understand uh, how we sell wine, and, and that's what we're doing now. So that's one of our improvement projects. We have two black belts working on that. Here are a couple of things that we stand for. Uh, we think that having a 4,300 acre ranch is, is a wonderful experience for everybody. 
Uh, we are building a bed and breakfast up there so people can come and stay for a long weekend, do hiking, riding, or whatever they want to do. Uh, we also market heavily uh, our black belt ideas to corporations like shirts and what have you. Uh, we really try to put data around all our processes uh, and we focus on the outdoor experience. Um, we still have a lot of work to do. We still have to improve a number of our processes uh, and we still have to work on uh, the training of the people. Uh, one of the things that we said from the beginning is that we will train people in the Six Sigma process thinking and the way to do business, but we are not General Electric by, by any measurement. It's more important for us that people understand the culture and the whole concept behind Six Sigma and the quality concept than it is that they hand in five projects and get marked off and say, well, now you're green belt. Uh, it's a thinking, it's a corporate culture of producing quality that is important to us. So yes, we train people, uh, but, but we don't test them as such. Uh, myself, I'm a, my master degree is mathematical statistics, so I have uh, the training that is needed for it. But I think it's important to understand that the three keys for us is to focus on the customer, that we think Six Sigma in everything we do, and that we continuously try to improve our processes in every step. And here are some of our wines and some of our products and some of the key buzzwords. Um, thank you very much for listening. And if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Uh, or we can proceed and taste some wine. So you were discussing, you know, we have standards for, you know, soil consistency and grape size and, you know, ripeness and things like that. I'm curious how you came up with those. You know, as you said, it's not like you need a two-foot log. You know, you need a wine at the end. So where do you go about benchmarking for the different steps in the process? Um, I think the best way to answer is uh, to pick an example. And... For example, before we harvest, we run lab results. We take some grapes and, and we pick at random across the vineyard and we want to make sure that they are within certain parameters. So there's one, one measurement that you do called bricks. It's named after a professor who invented a, uh, a way to measure sugar in, in, in juice. And uh, you want to make sure that you have enough sugar to produce the alcohol level, as an example. Uh, so, depending on the style of wine you want, you say, well, it probably has to be between 24, 23 to 28 for the heavy Sinfandel, something like that. So, so you know that per grape. Uh, but that's not quite enough because the sugar tells you something, but you also have to make sure that you get other things in the, in the final wine. So what we will do after we have acidity bricks and a couple of other things in, in the juice, we will go in and we will at random pick grapes from across the vineyard and we will taste them. And we basically go after two things when we do that tasting. We cross the seeds uh, between our teeth and of course they have to be brown because they're not ripe unless they're brown, but we also taste them and if there's the slightest touch of bitterness they're not ready, but you can measure that. Well, there's some new things coming out where maybe you can. But when you try to measure that uh, or taste that a couple of times, you know exactly whether it's right or wrong. So it, it's like zero one. Uh, the other thing you try to do when you taste the grapes at the end uh, is to cross the skin and see if there are any flavors coming out of that. Because that, that flavor that translates to the wine is the last thing that that happens with the grape before you pick them. Uh, when it comes to the soils, they're very exact. I mentioned boron as something you don't want, uh, and there's very exact limits for when it starts to damage the wine. And uh, my son is sitting down there. He could probably answer this better because he is into the viticultural side of it. Uh, but if you, for example, in an area have too much or too little magnesium, not within where you want to be, you can just, if you fly up in a helicopter and look down at the vineyard, you can see it. It, it just affects the growth that much. 
Was that a good enough answer, son? Okay. I passed. <laughs> What's your production, your yearly production? Uh, right now, we are at around 7,000 cases, and we have enough planted to get up to close to 10,000 for now. Uh, we have a two-year-old vineyard, We're close to 20 acres that will kick into the first year of production next year. Uh, we are just in between the Red Hills and Cobb Mountain. Hi, great uh, presentation. When you present your methods to maybe more traditional winemakers, have you gotten any reactions out of them? Uh, and if so, what? Positive, negative, bewildered? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> Well, first of all, I tested it on my own winemaker before I, I went public with it. Uh, but it, it's a balance between talking about the winemaking and talking about Six Sigma. As I said up front, people like it because it's a Six Sigma company from the beginning to the end. It, it's built that way. And, and that's a good uh, test case. And then also, when I speak to corporations or I've done a lot of presentations, uh, some presentations to the Department of Defense lately. Uh, you know, we finish off with a wine tasting, and that has some attractions. Uh, but from a technical point of view, uh, some winemakers like to make it a little more romantic. Uh, and, but you know, I would argue that what we just discussed with the seed and the skin. That's science. You have data around it. If you have the right palate and you've tried it a couple of times, you know exactly how that should be. Another example is uh, I mentioned the DeMaig process where you define, measure, uh, and try to improve what you're doing. We taste with our barrel makers. You saw those French oak barrels uh, every year about five, five years into the storage. And we say, well, there's too much that kind of oak and too little of that one. We want a little more vanilla, for example. So we need more of that kind of oak. So could you replace a couple of staves next year? And, and people will say that that's romantic nonsense. But if you have a winemaker with a really good palate, it's like a, it's like a measurement tool. He knows exactly. He can, a good winemaker can, I sometimes use the analogy that, you remember the old days, very old days, when people had cameras with rolls of films in them? And you took the picture, and you had an impression, but the winemaker develops the film for you and says, well, this is what you're tasting. This is, this is why. And he can do that. And then you have, all of a sudden, data that you can work on, and you can start to change and improve your process. Did you have a question as well? Pretty much the same question. OK. Anybody else? Well, let's try some wine. You're welcome.